Hi everyone, this is Teacher Nexo, and today I'm going to share with you two essential literacies of the 21st century education. It's both an honor and a privilege to have been given this opportunity to conduct a lecture, especially for our upcoming batch of education graduates. As early as now, I want to say congratulations and best of luck on your new beginnings. We all envision you to become successful licensed professional teachers. And to prepare you for that, I will be sharing with you today inputs about the different methodologies, pedagogies, and approaches in teaching. Those teaching strategies will be aligned with the new concepts of literacies in the 21st century evolving social phenomena and shared cultural practices across learning areas. So with that orientation, I hope that you will find it interesting. And without further ado, let's get started and jump right on to the main content. The topic is primarily about the roles of artistic and information literacies in teaching and in so right now, allow me to present to you the learning outcomes in which we are all familiar that in every learning session, it's very important that when we design our curriculum, we should be able to identify what will be the specific objectives or the learning outcomes that we have for our learners. So that's a rule of thumb for every educator. First, you should be able to define artistic and information literacy. Second, identify the activities of the students in a student-centered arts classroom. Let us be reminded that the major theme in the 21st century teaching is student-centeredness, and that kind of discipline must be observed in the arts classroom too. Third, discuss the important roles of artistic and information literacy in teaching and learning. Fourth, interpret figures 1 to 6, which will be presented later on pertaining to information literacy. And lastly, justify why artistic and information literacy have become part of the fields included in building and enhancing the students' literacies in the 21st century. Let's focus first on artistic literacy. What is artistic literacy? In the National Coalition for Core Art Standards, a conceptual framework for arts learning in 2014, artistic literacy is defined as the knowledge and understanding required to participate authentically in the arts. While individuals can learn about dance, media, music, theater, and visual arts through reading print texts, artistic literacy requires that they engage in artistic creation processes directly through the use of materials such as charcoal or paint or clay, musical instruments or scores, and in specific spaces just like concert halls, stages, dance rehearsal spaces, art studios, and computer labs. To simply put it, the acquisition of literacy in the arts is developed when the students have the ability to communicate and demonstrate effectively their understanding of the basic concepts and principles of the art form. In the 2017 Program Guide for the Arts, each of the five arts disciplines chapters includes a description of how the artistic processes are manifested in their art form. So it could be in the form of dance, media arts, music, theater, and visual art. And what does it mean to be artistic through the lens of an artist? Let's find out. Further questions need to be explored, which include the following. So number one, how should arts learning be structured so that students can begin to think like an artist? Second question, what are some best practices in teaching that create an active or student-centered learning environment? How do we really know that students have learned? What factors promote self-regulation and intrinsic motivation in learning? 
why are 21st century skills or personal dispositions important goals for students in arts education? And what are some procedures for creating curriculum and assuring alignment between what happens in the classroom, school district, and community expectations, and state and national standards? So with all those questions that we needed to explore, all those considerations that I have mentioned earlier, as well as the multiple areas that we needed to target in designing our curriculum, well, we can really say that the artistic thinking is indeed a complex process and sometimes contradictory interactions between the internal perspective or curiosity versus the external influences of the environment. So the real challenge here for us teachers is how are we going to create a balance? A balance between contradictory forces and the internal processes of creative thinking. So indeed, we can also say that to encourage the students to think like an artist is truly a difficult task. But of course, we can really do it if we really want to. That is why we needed this kind of session to be enlightened on how do we go about with our methods? What kind of activities would be sufficient enough to hit the multiple um, domains of our learners, especially the three fundamental domains, cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. So those were actually the fundamental areas that we needed to look into as we try to integrate all these literacies in the 21st century. Now, moving forward, I've mentioned about thinking like an artist, so let's try to dig more about it. The 1994 National Standards for the Arts clarifies that standards for arts education are important for two fundamental reasons. First, they help define what a good education in the arts should provide, a thorough grounding in the basic body of knowledge and the skills required both to make sense and to make use of each of the arts disciplines. An education in the arts means that students should know what is spelled out here, reach specified levels of attainment, and do both at defined points in their education. Put differently, Art standards provide a vision of both competence and educational effectiveness, but without creating a mold into which all arts programs must fit. Alright, so the 1994 standards articulated the knowledge and skills that arts education should provide, which targets mainly the cognitive aspect of our learners. In contrast to that, we have the 2014 National Core Art Standards embed with specific artistic um, knowledge and skills. So that standards now focuses on the learning that comes along with the artistic processes. And then from that standards, it was redefined and then defined by the process components found in each of the five arts disciplines. So I'm going to show you now the chart that would um, provide us like a guide when it comes to the process components for the art standards. So as you can see, the chart below lists many of the process components found in the art standards. For example, we have verbs which are intended under the dance column like explore, plan, revise, express, embody, present, analyze, interpret, critique, synthesize, and relate. And then we also have applicable verbs for media arts, music, theater, and visual arts. So it is clear that these verbs represent higher order thinking 
and are meant to develop 21st century dispositions and workplace skills. So we can definitely utilize that chart to target HOTS or higher order thinking skills as we formulate our learning outcomes for our students. Subsequently, it shall align our activities too. So um, for example, if we ask our students for an output um, as their performance task and we wanted to incorporate music to it, then we can refer to the list of verbs under music. So in that way, we can really um, make them experience what it is to plan like an artist, to think like an artist in the presentation of their outputs. And now speaking of the alignment of activities, now let's determine what are the best practices for active or student-centered instructions when teaching artistic literacy. So draw your attention now to this figure here. This figure shows a three-pronged approach to teaching in an active or student-centered classroom. So art classes by nature are places where students are involved in active learning. Students perform music, create art, present a play, dance to music, or invent new media. So we as teachers often model or use direct instruction so that students receive explicit guidance in executing their art. Any arts educator will agree that their exemplar is critical to the student's learning processes. However, this segment of the instruction represents just part of the instructional puzzle. Students may mimic what the teacher models, but true artistic literacy also involves artistic thinking on the part of the student. Looking back at the process components, we see that student self-regulation and independence is critical to addressing the artistic processes. As arts educators, it is necessary to teach the core knowledge and skills, but also with an eye toward developing students' personal dispositions. So in an active learning or student-centered arts classrooms, students not only engage in making the art, they are given time to make connections with their own cultural background, assess their technique and understanding, interact with peers, and participate in evaluating their own progress. The process is cyclical as learning progresses. That three-pronged approach highlights the idea that student-centered instruction encompasses a wide array of practices that brings students into the process of assessing their own growth and learning. Consequently, they gain a deeper sense of their progress and ultimately become independent learners. At this point, let's take a closer look at some of the concrete examples of an active student-centered arts classroom. So we can all be enlightened as to the specifics of how exactly do we help in immersing our students in the so-called authentic artistic process because we can have them experience different um, types of activities but the the real question is how do we encourage them to showcase their creativity and what is really the exact procedure in doing so so let's take a look at these examples on the next slide these are the activities done by students in a student-centered arts classroom so they learn to set personal goals they plan and create their own work self and peer evaluation conduct student-led rehearsals write art or performance critiques lead student research programs or production notes they also learn to collaborate in developing artistic products, programs, plots, movement, and they collaborate in design, problem solving, or analyses. They also learn to actively engage in error detection and revision. 
they assist in determining presentations, concerts, or shows, and at present, they have their first-hand experience in applying their artistic side when doing their assessment task, like designing an infographic about probably a topic on student-centeredness, editing an infomercial or video campaign, creating numerous PowerPoint presentations for their report, and creative minds manifest even in their writing compositions. So all of which contributed greatly for their artistic literacy in today's education system. So now that we already have an idea of what are the appropriate activities that we needed to provide for our learners, then the next part would be the role of inquiry and feedback. In order to accomplish those types of learner-centered activities, the role of the teacher now has shifted from that of a mere distributor of knowledge to a facilitator of learning. So take note, it's not just an ordinary facilitator. With an effective teacher-led instruction, we can support the principles of a student-driven learning experience. Therefore, we have to promote active student involvement and the key to an active learning environment is to establish a productive and scaffolded questioning skills. And at present, we already have many techniques for questioning in education. So one example is the famous Bloom's taxonomy. We also have the depth of knowledge model or the DOK model and the Socratic questions. And lastly, we have the question answer response questions. And I'm about to show you a model that encourages the use of verbs to not only target the lower and higher levels of cognition, but even the creative thinking and effective thinking. So the verbs in each category can be used as effective question starters. As you can see on your screen, these are examples of verbs for emergent thinking, critical thinking, creative thinking, and effective thinking. So posing questions, prompts, and cues to students is how teachers instigate active learning. Rather than relying primarily on reciting information or imitating procedures, we can use these interactive verbs and help our students personalize meaning and connect their prior knowledge at present or with the new set of information that we provide them. If we know how to use it in a scaffolded manner, our students may be able to extend or deepen their thinking and understanding of concepts and other points of view. Most importantly, these will allow our students to express personal, creative, and effective thoughts, enabling them to see opportunities to reflect their own beliefs, yet disagree in a civil manner. So the last part of our discussion for artistic literacy is using formative and summative assessments. So as educators, we know for a fact that the most significant element in developing our assessments is the teacher's ability to create proper questions, which is already addressed with the model that was presented to you earlier. So you can use that as a helpful resource or a reference guide while you formulate your questions for your assessments. Arts educators have become increasingly adept at creating summative assessment, in particular rubrics and checklists. Summative assessment is important for determining how well a student has mastered targeted skills and knowledge goals, as well as helping teachers determine student growth. On the other hand, formative assessment in the arts is most often the predominant measurement of student learning. 
However, the term formative assessment originated in the late 1960s and was later clarified by Benjamin Bloom and Associates in 1971. Popham defined a formative assessment as a planned process in which assessment elicited evidence of student status is used by teachers to adjust their ongoing instructional procedures or by students to adjust their current learning tactics. Speaking of formative assessments, some techniques found in making thinking visible represent innovative ideas for checking student cognitive, creative, and effective understanding, which include the following, and it has its respective definitions or descriptions. So we have Clickers, so it's a free app for phones that quickly assesses TRF or multiple choice questions. We also have Think Pair Share, Exit Tickets, One Minute Rides, Think Out Loud Modeling, Chalk Talk, and Glass Bugs Mud. So it's really up to you if you will also employ those techniques available. So the set of information and details can be a bit overwhelming because it's enormous but allow me to provide you with my own summary and provide you with just the basic understanding of artistic literacy. So we have the question here, what are the important roles of artistic literacy in teaching and learning? So. After reading the full-scale information about artistic literacy and upon trying to connect all elements of the said lesson, I have come up with a simple understanding of its role in both teaching and learning. I grasp that artistic literacy is a human right and a teachable skill. This discipline shall connect our works of art, both personally and meaningfully, and through this process enables us both educators and students to forge connections to our humanity and the humanity of others so in what way we learn to witness the possibility and the capability of every person to be creative and reach a specified level of artistry artistry through a variety of activities that target the curriculum framework in terms of arts and we are referring to arts from diverse perspectives in what we call artistic processes in other words to teach students to think like an artist in doing so we need to employ the process components in the art standards bridging it to the teaching methodologies which were tackled earlier under best practices for student-centered instruction. Second, we incorporate the underlying artistic principle to the aspect of inquiry and feedback, as well as in the giving of formative and summative assessments. Overall, these things draw out the colorful role of artistic literacy in the field of education. So in accordance with our learning outcomes, the last one states that we should be able to justify why artistic literacy has become one of the fields included in building and enhancing the students' literacies in the 21st century. So the focal point of artistic literacy in the 21st century is for students to participate authentically in the arts allowing the learners to undergo their personal processes of creating, performing, or saying yes to their artistic call. Although we cannot really expect them to become professional artists, but at least we get to encourage them to be consumers and advocates of the arts. The components of artistic process shall pave the way to connect the dots and unlock the 21st century skills such as creativity, critical thinking, um, collaboration, communication, flexibility, accountability, emotional control, um, responsibility, productivity, problem solving, and self-direction. So these skills 
that are mentioned are the byproducts of a student-centered classroom in which we know is the trend of the 21st century teaching. If we are to connect it to the new educational process from the content-based uh, education to outcomes-based education, indeed, it makes real sense why artistic literacy becomes a fundamental facet which will be supported by our meaningful experiences in doing differentiated and collaborative assessment projects. Now let's move on to the second part of this lecture, which is about information literacy. What is information literacy? According to the ACRL or the American Library Association, information literacy is the ability to recognize when information is needed and have the ability to locate, evaluate, and use effectively the needed information. It's also the set of skills needed to find, retrieve, analyze, and use information. The 21st century has been named the information era, owing to the explosion of information and the information sources. One cannot achieve the study target without practicing special information literacy skills. In other words, information literacy skills empower the people with the critical skills which will help them to become independent lifelong learners. These skills will enable people to apply their knowledge from the familiar environment to the unfamiliar. So with that foundational knowledge about information literacy, um, we can say that ultimately information literate people are those who have learned how to learn. They know how to learn because they know how knowledge is organized, how to find information and how to use information in such a way that others can learn from them. They are people prepared for lifelong learning because they can always find the information needed for any task or decision at hand. And information literacy elements were defined by Bundy in 2004 under three main elements. We have the generic skills, the information skills, and then we have values and beliefs. So in order to guide us efficiently and effectively in the acquisition of skills needed to become an information literate individual, I will be presenting to you six different figures. So to enumerate the concepts behind each figure, I'll provide you the breakdown from figures one to six and the summary of the underlying principles in each of the illustration. So first is the concept of information literacy by Lao Chassis in 2006. So information literacy is a procedure of skills that empowers a person to examine, access, investigate, and use information. This figure tells us the in-depth thinking and the power of learning, which gives emphasis to the digital era, a period where a shift process occurs from industrial base to an information based economy using computer or other technology devices as medium or communication. From a pool of different orientation like library orientation and to other concepts at present, it sums up the necessity for user education, training, bibliographic instruction, which leads to development of information skills directed to fluency and developing information competencies. Now let's proceed to figure two, which tells us about the key areas of information literacy. This is according to Hepworth in 2000. So clearly the figure shows that information literacy is grounded with four key areas. So first, we have learning how to use information tools to access, organize, and distribute data. Second, learning thinking process associated with knowledge creation. And third, learning the intellectual norms of the subject domain associated. 
and the fourth one is learning how to communicate with people to access and exchange data information so let's move on directly to the relationship between information literacy and lifelong learning um, by Bundy in 2004 which is figure number three so for this one it simply tells us that information literacy is a prerequisite and an essential enabler for lifelong learning so it's not really a complicated one because it gives us three questions why is information literacy so important two who needs information literacy and three what is learning so it also convi conveys rather the infinite cycle and how it is interconnected um, to each other as it progresses and for this figure we can also associate this to the zone of proximal development so the fourth figure is called learning cycle so the learning cycle basically involves four stages namely concrete learning reflective observation abstract conceptualization and active experimentation so effective learning can be seen when the learner progresses through the cycle the learner can also enter the cycle at any stage of the cycle with logical sequence and then proceeding to the fifth one which speaks about the levels of learning by Haycock and Haycook in 1981 and also Bloom in 1956 so the effective lecturer takes the students to the higher cognitive level from surface learning to deep learning information literacy models or programs pave the way to achieve the higher cognitive level in learning similar to bloom's taxonomy and then lastly figure number six is the so-called solo taxonomy by biggs in 1999 so the solo taxonomy stands for structure of observed learning outcome it provides a framework for analyzing a student's depth of knowledge it is an alternative to bloom's taxonomy the framework serves to describe the levels of increasing complexity in a learner's understanding of subjects or performance task so from pre-structural knowledge to extended abstract conceptualization So I know that those figures presented to you are merely a guide for us to be able to set our foundational knowledge on information literacy. So just to keep things simple, let me provide you now a breakdown of the important components for us to define information literacy the best way. So let's just put it this way. In the context of becoming an independent lifelong learner in the 21st century, well, information literacy is considered the competence to discover, to process, to analyze, evaluate, and utilize information in this information explosion era. The acquired skill set in this discipline geared the learners with critical dexterity more than just being wise in absorbing data one has the ability to learn how to learn the increasing access to information opens the gateway for individuals especially for our students to apply their knowledge to figure out how to organize it and to make good use of it to share it with others both in a familiar environment and in an unfamiliar setting so in simple words this targets the ability to communicate information in all its various formats this encompasses suitability and reliability of information source as well as the currency of information that they get 
out of the different sources. So, as we are about to finish our discussion, let's try to go back again to the question, what are the important roles of information literacy in teaching and in learning? So, let me just answer that question by providing you now like a summary of um, the main idea about information literacy. So, number one, asking questions and seeking answers, finding information, forming opinions, evaluating sources and making decisions, fostering successful learners, effective contributors, confident individuals, and many more are just among the complex concepts of information literacy. So the real question is, how exactly do we become information literate individuals? What are the important roles? So this particular lesson or this topic about information literacy has really touched so many aspects and the figures 1 to 6 presented the elements to define the specifics of those roles with the common idea that access to information and critical use of information is indeed fundamental or cardinal to achieving independence to our lifelong learning. So we may claim ourselves to be educated, but the real measure is if we are information literate, do you consider yourselves information literate? So to reiterate, ultimately, information literate people are those who have learned how to learn. So that will be the real challenge for us educators and how are we going to instill that one to our learners in which they need to learn how to learn. So everything that I have mentioned about the roles of information literacy in teaching and in learning already support the purpose or intentions as to why it is one of the fields included in building and enhancing literacies in the 21st century. So needless to say, the associated skills in this discipline is very important for today's learners. So I hope that you have gained so much um, information from this lecture about artistic and information literacy. And I truly wish you well, all the best for your journey as future educators. And hopefully the acquisition of this learnings for artistic and information literacy will serve you well in the pursuit of your career in the education field. So I will see you all next time and may you all have a great day.